whisper. Speak a word of courage. Speak, Lord, for your people are listening. Amen. Almost every Christian sanctuary has one. They are made of polished brass or stained oak. They are bathed in spotlights or backlights or the lights of stained glass windows. They bear the broken, bloody body of Jesus or, a, or as bare as fresh cut lumber. Although Christian denominations have different sizes and shapes and architectural styles, almost every Christian church has as its focal point the cross. And although Christian denominations have different theological beliefs and worship practices, the one universal symbol across the Christian spectrum is the cross of Christ. Our sanctuary has a cross, a beautiful cross, and it has a good story to go with it as well. And John Buchanan shared the story with me this week by email. So thank you, John, for remembering and sharing the story. It goes like this. After the Woodland Church burned with the insurance company, or with, I'm sure, sorry, with the insurance money, after tithing 10% to charity, we decided to add on to our current building. As part of that design, we chose to redesign the front of the sanctuary including all the newly exposed and repainted organ pipes. The committee and our architect agreed that we would need a cross hanging in front of the new organ pipes to, quote, complete the look. Enter Jim and Kate Lawrence, devout Mormons who had been very active in our community theater players group, and in their large woodworking shop here in Ben Avon, they built sets. So the building committee asked them to design a cross for our sanctuary. They presented at least six designs to the committee before we agreed on the current one. After the presentation, we thanked them profusely and said we would now need to go out and find someone to build it. They looked at us rather disappointedly and said, you mean we can't build it for you? We were thrilled. It took Jim a couple of months working in his basement workshop to deliver the finished product you now see. Our cross and other crosses in churches are beautiful decorations, marking the place as a house of God, a church of Christ, calling us to praise God in the holy sanctuary. But the cross is more than a beautiful decoration. It is also an object of devotion. Crosses are worn around the necks of clergy and lay people alike. Crosses are painted on sacred objects and tattooed on bodies. Crosses mark the graves of our loved ones and anchor our beads of prayer. I grew up with rosary beads and they are different beads and you hold them in your hand and as you touch a different bead, you say a different prayer sometimes a Hail Mary, sometimes a, an Our Father. And of course, the cross is where you begin and end. And so the cross is part of an object of devotion that calls us to pray. But the cross is more than an object of devotion. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus teaches his disciples a hard lesson that he will have to suffer and die 
before he is raised. Peter does not like this one bit. So he denies this to Jesus. And in turn, Jesus rebukes Peter and says that Peter is setting his mind not on divine things, but on human things. I don't know, maybe Peter thought that he was following a Messiah with might, a savior with success, a king wearing a crown, not bearing a cross. At the time, the cross was a tool used by Rome to execute the worst of the criminals, those that were an enemy of the state. Dying on a cross was a gruesome spectacle, the most painful and humiliating death imaginable. And that's what Jesus said that he was going to do, suffer and die on a cross. We have heard this story many times throughout our lives. We know it well, and, and sometimes I think it becomes so familiar that we forget about its power and we overlook its pain. Well, many years ago, when my daughter Rebecca was just three, we went to a Good Friday service and she was sitting on my lap and we were looking at the bulletin for the service. And on the front was a picture of Jesus on a cross. And there he was bleeding from his side. And I noticed as Rebecca started rubbing the picture, and especially Jesus' side, and she said, Jesus has a boo-boo. Ouch! She reminded me in that moment of the power of the cross of the depth of pain and suffering that Jesus went through for us and for our salvation. The cross, it's more than a symbol of death. It's a call to pick up the cross and follow. Jesus says to his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus was not calling his disciples to hang up the cross as a decoration or to even wear a cross around their neck or even to die on a cross. But he was calling them to take up the cross and to follow as his disciples. Well, the disciples had a front row seat. They could hear what Jesus taught. They could see Jesus heal. They marveled at his miracles. They prayed with him. But what about disciples today? How do we know how to pick up our cross? and follow Jesus. That's the point of the cross. The cross shows us the way. There are two beams in any cross, right? One beam points up, up to God. The church I served in Finley, Ohio, had a tall steeple with a cross on the top of it. And it was a visible symbol to the community. Those of us that went, attended this church, we saw it and we knew it was there, but we kind of overlooked it, didn't pay much attention to it. But that all changed one day when our youth directors told me that her daughter was inviting a friend to come to youth group at our church. And the friend said, well, what church do you go to? And she said, I go to the church where the cross points up. What did she mean? 
think it means that the cross points up to God. That is, we believe that God is all-knowing, all-loving, all-present, and that we trust that no matter what, God is with us. As Jesus will later pray in the gospel, even Jesus prayed, Abba, for you all things are possible. So if you are willing, let this cup of suffering pass from me. Yet not my will, but thy will be done. When we take up our cross and follow Jesus, we believe that the cross points up to God and we trust God's will for us. The cross has two beams. One points up to God and the other points out, out to our neighbors. This Lent, we're studying the book that Brian mentioned by Jill Duffield. It's called Lent in Plain Sight, a devotion through 10 objects. So during Lent, I'm going to preach on these objects. The first one today is the cross. When we take up the cross and follow, we realize that we have to sometimes put our own go in the way that is against our own desires. When we take up our cross, Sometimes we have to put aside our own needs for the needs of someone else. When we take up our cross, then we realize just how heavy and hard it can be. In her book that I referenced, Jill Duffield writes this, We harbor hopes for revenge. Christ desires mercy. We want success. Jesus tells us to be servants. We stay up thinking about how to get even. Jesus commands us to love our enemies. We hold grudges. Jesus says, forgive 70 times 7. All of this godly wisdom seems foolish, but there's nothing more powerful than vulnerable, sacrificial love. This love can be shown in many different ways, simple ways, and Duffield notes a few of them. Let that person ahead of you in traffic be the first to apologize. Tip generously. Make the call. Send the note. Ask that beleaguered person if they are all right. None of these come close to the death on a cross of our Savior. But each one honors his sacrifice and attunes our minds and our hearts to the world that he so loves. In our Bible study on Wednesday, Jody Jackson shared that her brother-in-law used to make crosses she said her favorite one of all was called the beckoning cross. She described it as one where Jesus was on the cross and one of his arms was nailed to the cross. And the other arm, but the other arm was reaching out, beckoning us as if to say, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Well, as a pastor, not surprisingly, I have a, quite a collection of crosses. <laughs> and so I brought uh, just two to show you today, two of my favorites. This is a wooden cross, and it hangs in my bedroom. And as you can see, it is not straight. <laughs> and it reminds me that the road of discipleship is not always straight. 
In fact, there are usually twists and turns. And as you can see in the bottom, it is not perfect. In fact, it's broken. And it reminds me that when I take up my cross and follow Jesus, sometimes it hurts. And often there are scars. But always the cross points up, up to God in whom I trust. The second cross I wanted to show you is the cross I'm wearing today. Uh, it's one of my favorites that I wear. And it's a simple cross, but it has footprints on it. And it points us to follow Jesus in the way of discipleship. It's the same cross that the Stephen ministers of the church wear. And it was Sandy Stoffer's favorite. And whenever I wear my cross, it reminds me of Sandy. Because she was a model of discipleship. She took up her cross and followed Jesus, even to her death without fear, and with great faith. But perhaps the most powerful cross that we can wear is the one that we receive on Ash Wednesday. This, when, this Ash Wednesday, we had drive through ashes. People drove through in their cars, and I marked them with a Q-tip, <laughs> marked an ashen cross on their forehead. And as I marked the foreheads of people that I know and love, reminding them that in life and in death, we belong to God. As we have this mark on our foreheads, it reminds us of God's gift of amazing grace and eternal love. And in response to that incredible gift, what else can we do but take up our cross and follow Jesus in loving God and loving our neighbors? The cross. It is more than a decoration on, at, on which to stare. It is more than an act of devotion to wear. It is more than a symbol of death to despair. It is a way of life to bear and Christ's love to share. <laughs>